stumbled into a small drawing room, and there was a lady. Then she uttered words that give me a chill every time I think of them. I heard these little footsteps coming up to my door really, really quickly, and the door creaked open. This doesn't make any sense. There's no one else in this house. I just couldn't move. I, I, I out of fear. I was paralyzed. This is one night. I was laying in bed, and at the end of the hallway, I saw a woman. I was terrified, and her eyes were saying, "Come with me." And I heard someone call Paul from my grandfather's room. Out of the corner of my eye. I see a man, and I freaked out. I was terrified. From the first time I think I saw a, a, a horror movie as a kid in Nebraska. I was always envious, envious of people who got to see a strange lady by the side of the road in flowing white robes who vanished when you tried to reach her. And I've never understood this fear of seeing a ghost, but that quickly changed. My wife had a good friend that she had been at Stevens College with, and my wife's college mate said, "You ought to come down and see where I grew up." That's what we did. It was uh, in Virginia. And it was what you would really call a, a country estate with the rolling hills and stables and many, many rooms. It was a dinner, about ten or twelve people. I didn't know who the other people were. I only knew my wife and her friend, and there was chat in the drawing room. Just as they were about to call everybody into the dining room, I said, "Is there a bathroom right near here?" And I was told, "Yes. Uh, go down to the end of this hall, and then when you get to the end, turn left, take the next right, and then the very next left." Um, I almost asked for a map, but I found it. So I finished in the bathroom and started back. And I realized almost immediately that I had forgotten the second turning in reverse, and I was lost. I found myself in another part of the house, and it was not where I was supposed to be. And I suddenly sort of stumbled into a small drawing room. And there was a lady sort of looking into the fireplace. Something strange was in the air, and uh, she turned.
And I, I have to say, I got a, an odd feeling. She, she so it's looked at me. And I thought, oh, I'm sorry, I've interrupted your thoughts. I'm trying to find the dining room. I can't get back there. And I left. I found my way back from the bathroom uh, eventually. And uh, once everybody was seated, I said, isn't the lady joining us? This produced a very slight, odd, silent moment on the part of a couple of people at the table. What lady? And my wife's friend said, uh, what lady? And I said, there was a lady near the fireplace. I just wondered if she's going to be joining us. And she said, What was she wearing? And I said, Well, she was um, wearing riding clothes. Uh, Did you notice her hair? She said, Did you notice her hair? I said, yes, she had nice red hair. Then she looked at her father in a significant way and uttered words that give me a chill every time I think of them. Daddy. She's back. At that point, I was led into a nearby room and uh, shown a painting and there she was red hair the riding clothes and I was asked is that the lady you saw I said yes and that her father was rather rattled I was asked, is that the lady you saw? Yes, it is. I said, yes. And that her father was rather rattled. I used to see her as a little girl. Many years ago, there was a writing accident, and she died tragically. And I then learned that the lady I presumably had seen was killed in a riding accident 20 years earlier. She was a family member. She'd been out riding. The horse stumbled a hedge, as they say. And she broke her neck and died. And Slight chill on my part, more than slight. So I guess the question becomes, what did I see? Apparently, this was not the first visitation. Uh, she had been there several times over a long period of years. This friend of my wife's had seen her before in the very same place. The father had had it happen to him before. My wife's friend said, that was the lady's room, the room she liked to sit in, the place she was able to get away from everybody else and sit and contemplate. And this was her, her refuge.
you know, it was a little scary and a little spooky. I thought, wait a minute. Have I now joined the community of people who can say I've seen a ghost? I didn't know what to think. It certainly cast a strange pall over the rest of the evening. It's just, um, it's so bloody strange. I never believed in ghosts until I moved into that house. I realized that um, they do exist, they're very powerful, and if you're on their bad side, you won't be happy. About three and a half years ago, I bought my first house in Hollywood Hills. It was an old house from the 1920s. I remember the old owner of the house said, this place is very magical, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> and I just thought, oh, okay, that's great. I was so elated to finally move into this house and everything should have been good. But I remember just thinking something seemed off. Even starting the very first night that I ever slept there, I remember just feeling like something wasn't quite right. There was one night, the first week that I lived there, that I was laying in bed and going to sleep. And I heard footsteps above me. And I look around and think that I had an intruder or burglar or something. And I went up to investigate. And I, I crept around with a flashlight. There was nothing, there was nobody. The doors were all locked, nobody could have gotten in. And um, I just remember thinking, this doesn't make any sense, there's no one else in this house. So, I went back to bed. <sighs> and I heard the little boy running and panting and giggling upstairs. And then I heard these little footsteps coming up to my door really, 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 really quickly and panting like a little kid that was out of breath. And the door creaked open. And I heard panting. I was never so scared in my life. I just couldn't move. I, I, I out of fear, I was paralyzed. And then I heard this very deep, husky, croaky, scary old lady's voice. That was admonishing this little boy. The little boy went from being just out of breath and sort of having fun and mischievous to sobbing and heaving. And he just let out this horrible, horrible, death rattle little moan. And then it was over. I just thought I must just be going insane. I must just be having some sort of psychotic meltdown because this isn't possible. One day after all of this had transpired, I had a couple of friends over and one of my friends has a daughter that she brought over as well. And I remember it was a bit later in the day and the little girl just started staring and she was transfixed by something. And we said, what are you looking at? <laughs> and we said, who? You 
and my friend and I said, no, see who? What are you talking about? And she said, you don't see the old lady and the little boy looking right back at us? I, I got such shivers because we couldn't see them. It was all so bizarre. I had no other choice than to, to realize that there was something going on here that I did not understand, wasn't in my control, and I needed somebody more powerful than me to deal with. So I contacted a woman who is a clearer and a psychic. She offered to come do a house call. She immediately gasped. What? And I said, What's wrong? And she, she said, I have been doing this my entire career. I've never, ever felt this much energy. She said there were two ghosts that were very resistant to leaving. I said, there are two ghosts. I said, a, a young male figure. She said the two spirits were a young male figure and an older female spirit. You're not wanted here, go! I didn't tell her that it was specifically a little boy and a gold lady that I was concerned about. I couldn't believe it. She had to haggle with these two ghosts that would just not leave. She saged the entire house. She put salt and rosebuds in every corner of the room. She would walk from corner to corner and sort of chant under her breath. Please, go! You're banished! And by the time she was done, it was dusk. And she said, okay, it's all fine. It's all cleared now. Everyone's gone. It's your house. It just has your energy in it now. And I said, okay. I went to bed that night thinking there's no one else here but me, there's no other energies, everything's fine. And I could sleep easy for the first night in that house. I finally felt safe and secure and I thought it was all over. Later that night, I was sleeping and... <laughs> I went to bed that night thinking there's no one else here but me, there's no other energies, everything's fine, and I could sleep easy for the first night in that house. Later that night, I was sleeping and <laughs> the same little footsteps pitter-pattered around the floor and came right up to the door. And I could hear his breath, and I could hear him giggling, and the door creaked open. And I could see a little child. I could actually see his little face. I could see what he looked like. His hair was parted over in an old-style fashion. And then there was an old woman. And she looked over at me, and she said, you have to go. You can't stay here. This is my house. I've never been that scared before because I could actually see them. And then they disappeared immediately. I think she was just getting more and more powerful and letting me know that clearing the house didn't exactly clear them of uh, getting away from me. But I didn't know what to do about it, and I felt like I wasn't safe. This being said, it creeped me out enough to uh, investigate the history of the house. What I came to discover was that in the 1930s, this young starlet lived in that house with her mother and her son. We've been sharing this this whole time. It's all you. It's my son. This is not the way I break. Oh, I'm not asking you. I don't know, honey. 
and I found out that just one day out of the blue, This starlet snapped and flew into a rage and killed her mother and her son by pushing them out the huge windows in the living room. The starlet was committed to an insane asylum for the rest of her life. After doing this research, I've come to deduce that their spirits never, ever actually left that house. I just said, I've had enough. I was becoming a complete wreck and an insomniac. And I just decided that she didn't want me there. And so I put the house on the market. And the people who bought the house were just so excited about it. So I just said, you can have it. Something went terribly wrong, and it's already back on the market. All I could do was take those sheets and pull them over my head. I stayed like that as long as I could, thinking if I can just fall asleep, if I can just fall asleep, then this will all be over. When I was a kid, we moved a lot. And by the time I was a freshman in high school, I had already lived in about 13 different houses. And when I was six years old, we moved into that big house. It was huge. And I remember walking through the house, we were in awe. We were walking through just going, wow. We were so excited. My favorite place in that house was my mom's bathtub. My mom and dad had this amazing spa bathtub. One day, I jump in the tub, turn on the jets, and my mom would always sit there with me. So I went under the water, and I'm spinning around in circles, and I'm just being a kid. And I came up, rubbed my eyes, and I pull my face down and open my eyes, and my mom's not there. And in that moment, all the water got cold, ice cold. It made absolutely no sense. I just went woof, holding the towel, and my mom came in, and I was just shaking. She goes, you OK? And I was like, I'm done. And I was afraid. I didn't take too many baths after that. A few years after, I remember sitting in the TV room downstairs. My brothers were there with me. And we were home alone. And while we're sitting there watching, we heard footsteps above us. So my brothers and I decided to go upstairs and see who was there. And looked all over, nobody there. So we went back downstairs. And we're sitting for about five minutes. And we hear those footsteps again. And they were all the way from my parents' bedroom to my bedroom. And all of us were frozen. Because there was nobody at the house. And 
And when my parents got home, there really wasn't anything for us to say because we couldn't find anything. And we were too afraid to bring it up. And I remember going to bed that night and just thinking, this house might be a little too big. For a few days past, I was laying in bed and I couldn't fall asleep. And I'd have the door wide open. I'm looking down this 40 foot hallway. And at the end of the hallway, I saw a woman. I was in disbelief. She was facing away. I was laying in bed and I couldn't fall asleep. I'm looking down this 40 foot hallway. At the end of the hallway, I saw a woman. And she turned. And she looked at me. I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. My natural reaction was to take the sheets, pull them over my head. And I remember thinking, if I just keep this over my head, maybe she won't be there. But I couldn't resist. I look again. Now, she's at the base of my bed. I couldn't move, and I watched her walk around the side of the bed, looking directly at me. And she was standing there. And when she looked me in the eyes, she reached her hand up, and her eyes were saying, come with me. I wanted to get the hell out of there. And all I could do was take those sheets and pull them over my head. And I stayed that way. It was the longest night I ever spent in that house. One day, I jumped on my bike and rode down our driveway, stopping at the end of the driveway. And a jogger was jogging by and stopped. And he asked, do you live in that house? And I said, yeah. Jogger then proceeded, do you know what happened in that house? Before you guys moved in, I said, no. The jogger said, there was a single mom. She had just gotten divorced and went into a really deep depression. She had kids. And they would check in with each other. The mom would make sure the kids were OK, and the kids would make sure the mom was OK. The kids had realized they hadn't seen their mom for a little while. So they went upstairs and went into the master bedroom. And when they walk into the bathroom, they look down. And find a full tub of water with their mom dead. She apparently had electrocuted herself in that tub. 
with her radio. Instantly, I knew that that was the woman I saw at the foot of my bed. I came back to the house and told my brothers the story of what happened in the house. That day, we found out that every single one of us had seen her, and all of us felt relieved. Up until that day, not one of us spoke of this woman. And within about a month and a half, we moved. Once we moved out, our parents told us that we got it for half the renting price because of what had happened. And a few years after we moved out, the house was completely knocked to the ground. Looking back, I think the woman felt that she neglected her children when she was in her depression. And she was trying to reconnect with her kids through me and my brothers. And she just stayed to hang out with us till we left. And maybe now she's in a better place. I was always open to believing in the paranormal, but I'd never had these experiences. And after this, I was, I was terror, I was terrified. When I was in seventh grade, um, I was 12. And right after Thanksgiving, my mom got a phone call explaining that my cousin Tommy had passed away. My mom told me that a drunk driver had hit Tommy's car. He was 18, and it was just shocking. It was really, really hard to see my, my whole family go through such a, such a loss. Tommy was the oldest grandson, and Tommy and my grandfather were beyond close. I've never seen such pain and such loss. The day after the accident, we, we all gathered at my grandpa Paul's house for the next couple of nights to get ready for the funeral and uh, make the arrangements. It was very, very sad to, to watch grandpa go through that. It was a pretty rough day. That night, I went to bed and I had a dream about a soldier. But I mean, it was a really distinct visual, like a young military man with short cropped hair. He looked like from like the 30s, and he was sort of wearing the old school traditional military outfit with the little cap. And he saluted me. And that was the dream. But I really didn't think too much of it. I thought I'd just been watching, like, you know, too many late night movies or something. I went to bed and I had a dream about a young military man. And he saluted me. And that was the dream. But I really didn't think too much of it. I thought I'd just been watching, like, you know, too many late night movies or something. The next day, I'm upstairs in my grandfather's house. And I heard someone call Paul from my grandfather's room. And um, I walked into the room and
no one was there. But out of the corner of my eye, I see a man, and not just any man, but the same soldier from my dream the night before. And I freaked out. It was crazy. I mean, I literally saw the same regalia, the pants, the hat, you know, this figure. And it was only for a second, but I mean, I know what I saw. He walked through uh, the open door to the walk-in closet, and after a moment, I jumped forward to like see who the hell was in the closet. And no one was there. I was terrified. But in the threshold of the doorway, there was like a pocket knife. I bent down to pick up the pocket knife, and you could tell that it had some history to it. It looked older, a little bit rustic, but it was in good condition. Grandpa. So I go downstairs and I find Grandpa, and I go, I just saw someone in your room. I saw I saw a, a man, I saw a, a guy in a military suit, and then my grandfather saw what I was holding in my hand. And he goes, where'd you find that? And I go, on the floor in your closet. And he was just looking at it with just like complete disbelief. I could just tell that something weird was happening. Grandpa Paul had a long and distinguished career. Grandpa Paul had gone to LaSalle Military Academy in Long Island. After Military Academy, he served in World War II, and he never really spoke about it too much, but his walls were covered in military decor and paraphernalia and memorabilia. You could tell that he was always very proud of that. He goes, this is my old Military Academy pocket knife. I lost this 30 years ago. And he goes, I've moved from two different houses since then. There is no way that it was just sitting on the floor in the middle of the closet. He just could not believe that I'd found this after 30 years of, of it being missing. But there it was. And I mean, the look in his eyes, it was shock and he went to, to his office. And he came back and he had a thick photo album from, from, I guess, his time in the military. So he opens the photo album and he turns to the second or third page. And I was in shock. That's him. There is the man from my dream and the man who I saw walk into his walk-in closet. Just undoubtedly the same person. I'd never seen this person before in my life. And it turns out that the pocket knife was from my grandfather's best friend from Military Academy, who had since passed away. My grandfather started to cry. We were both just trying to, to make sense of this. And what we surmised is that his best friend was there ushering my cousin Tommy to the other side. He sort of thought that it was that it was his friend's way of saying, you know, mission accomplished. Okay, buddy. I'll see you around. Like we've got Tommy and He's all right. And I think it really helped us both have some closure. It was really powerful. <laughs>